We're here to answer your game gaming or game night questions. So tonight's question is, what games did we play at the last ever Sean Con, and what did we think of each of them? That's right. This past weekend, I was down in Windsor, and while there, we got in plays of 10 different games. Tonight, we're going to both be sharing our thoughts on those games, all of which, well, not all of which, most of which were new to me, but a couple of older. New, new, new yeah. features. Yeah, I was going to say that you had never played the production copy of Garinto, so I thought they were uh, all new to you. Because no, because uh, witches. Herb witches? Or witches. See, okay. All right. Fair enough. Did you play with the witches before? <laughs> yeah. All right. Close enough. Almost all were new to Sean. Now, I just said this was going to be the last ever Sean Con, and at this point, we are pretty sure that's true. Um, for those that missed it last week during our announcement section, we let everyone know that Sean has started the process of moving down here to the edge of Windsor, about 20 minutes away from where I am here in the East End. There is still a lot of work to be done, and as mentioned before, this may end up disrupt disrupting our regular schedule. It shouldn't be too long, though, before we're both together in the same area again. And while once Sean moves down here, with us being able to game together won't be such a big deal, and it seems kind of silly to call it SeanCon anymore. I'd hope when he's here, we're probably going to game together pretty much every weekend and be able to say, it's Sean Con this weekend. It's another Sean Con. It's Sean Con number 365. Uh, so there's a pretty good chance at this point that last weekend was the final ever Sean Con. But, it will be missed. But I'm not there yet. So well, this past weekend when Sean was in town, we played a lot of games. Um, some of these were with Kat and Tori on Friday night which were a mix of four and five player games. Others were played with the three of us, Deanna, Sean, and I. And Sean and I also got in a couple of two-player games as well. Overall, in the end, it ended up being 10 different games, including some expansions. Um, and most of the games played were played more than once, which is actually a little rare from when Sean's in town. Usually we try to, well, except for the one time we mashed <laughs> in a whole bunch of Draconis Invasion in one weekend. Uh, most of the time we try to play as many different games as possible, but this time there were some games worth playing more than once. Indeed, but enough preamble. Let's get on to the games. So what I thought would be interesting here tonight to talk about these games is to talk about it based on how often they got played this last weekend. Starting with the games we only played once and finishing with the game that got played the most. Let's build some anticipation and let's see if people can guess what our most played game this past weekend was. Sounds like a plan. So up first, we played a two-player game of Super Motherload. I'm saying up first. It wasn't actually the first game we played, but the, the one-player game. One of the games we played once was a two-player game of Super Motherload. Now, this is a unique deck-building game uh, from Canadian designers published by Roxy, Rox Lee Games. Uh, it's got a sci-fi theme of mining an alien planet for gems and artifacts and trying to build the best mining crew for the job. Now, the actual game is about playing your crew cards to dig and bomb Deeker into the ground in a very Dig Dug-like style. Digging gets you gems as well as other useful items or abilities like drawing more cards. Now, the gems are used to buy more crew cards with a rather unique purchasing mechanism. Now, the real twist here to me is the fact that you aren't actually scoring the gems or even how deep you mind or how much you mind. Instead, it's how much you've improved your crew and the number of achievements you earn during play that wins you the game. So this was the first time we ever tried this one. I know you've heard us talk about it on past episodes when we played with Tori and Kat. What do you think of Super Motherload? Honestly, this was super fun. And I could see playing it way more often as a sort of a longer filler. Uh, when, you, when you know you want a game, but you don't have the time for something more meaty, but you also don't, you know, you know you don't, you've got more than just the 15 minute Quick, right. quick game. You've got maybe an hour, but you don't have the time to do all the setup and everything else of a, a bigger, meteor hour long game. Fair. Um, I would say with the pair of us, even with the teach, it, it felt like it was under an hour, which is the box time yeah. on it. Yeah, the, I, the, I'm guessing the box time is more for three or four players. Right. Yeah, person, I really dig this game. It's it's unique. Um, I like unique games. I like games that do something different. Um, the whole digging with these weird tunnel uh, tiles to cover up like. And and is neat. But what I like the most, actually, is the card buying system. I love the way you take the gems and you have to put them on your people and you don't get the card until you get to a certain total. And the, the early crew costs 10, then the next one's 15, 20 and so on. And there's this whole thing where you don't want to overspend and you get a really good gem and you really want to put it on this card, but you're going to waste money. So do you start someone else 
And there's just lots of interesting decision points with it. Now, my one problem with the game, which we found when we played a whole bunch of times in a row, and note this wasn't pile obligation. We weren't trying to like shove it all in. It was just new to me. So I was showing it off to everyone. Is I found the game started to feel the same. There isn't a lot of different things in the game. Everyone starts off with the same deck. Yes, there are some asymmetry there with card abilities, but basically it's, you know, dig, bomb, dig with a rainbow. Um, you know, in the boards, there are two sides to each board, which is nice, but once you've seen them, you've seen them all. So because of that, for me, this is one I'll take out now and then. Especially Sean shows up, he's never played it. And I can totally see the next time Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, comes over, be like, hey, check out this Dig Dug game. And the next time I run an event at CG Realm, be like, check out this Dig Dug game. But it doesn't seem like a game that I'm going to be like, every one day when my Monday group comes over, we're going to play. I think you're going to get sick of this if you play it too often. But if you space it out, really solid game. Yeah, I could, I can definitely see playing, you know, banging out a, a bunch of games in that would certainly grow tiring. Uh, but at the same time, I could see, you know, every once in a while, you know, every couple of weeks, once a month mm -hmm. or something like that, pulling that out. And uh, I think because of the the difference in decks uh, mm -hmm. alone, between the, the difference of decks uh, combined with the difference in boards, even though there aren't that many boards, um, you can have it, it could feel like uh, still feel fun without growing too tired. Now, if I remember correctly, there's also a system in the book for drafting your starting deck instead of studying with the, the starting four. You know what? It's been a while. Out. I will say it was kind of on my pile of maybe get rid of. But then once we played it with Sean, I'm like, I, it had been enough time. that I was like, no, this game's actually better than I thought. So yep. it, it's back firmly on the shelf to stay there for now. Now, our next single gameplay was a three player game, a brew crafters travel card game, which we played on the patio at the Walkerville Brewery. Now, here, Dee and I grabbed a pint, Sean grabbed a cider, and we had some awesome Detroit-style pizza from Slices a couple doors down. Uh, this included the Detroit Muscle Pizza, which I love. It's a pretty traditional um, Detroit-style pizza. But we also tried a Detroit Cuban pizza, which was a pizza with pulled pork, mustard, and pickles on it. Now, before I get to the game we played, what would you think of Walkerville and Slices? Uh, you know what? I The pint of Argyle cider was great. And it was also a nice, great callback to my grandparents who used to live on Argyle Street right there in Walkerville. Yeah, which is one of the streets the the, the brewery is on, which yeah. is why I think they go with that name. Yeah. So as for the pizza, it was solid Detroit style. I mean, you're mm -hmm. getting the right stuff there. Uh, and I enjoyed the both the taste of both. I think, though, in hindsight, I would probably order the Cuban again nice. over the okay. pizza. Uh, while not bland, I found the pizza just wasn't quite as flavorful as the Cuban. Uh, and that was a selling point for me. Um, and oh. for anyone who's confused, the Cuban is based off of the Cuban sandwich. Uh, yep. So, yeah, I was confused. I didn't know what a Cuban sandwich was. <laughs> I, I, Deanna felt the same. Deanna preferred the Cuban to the pizza, but uh, it, I, I love the Detroit mu muscle. I, it, it's fantastic. That is one of the best Detroit style pizzas. It, I'm I'm sorry, uh, Professor Zah, but it's up there with your Roni rubber. It, it is damn good and and personal instead of way too much food. Oh, yeah. Um, I I brought you there to try the Detroit Muscle. Well, I didn't mind the Cuban. I it was okay. There was definitely that sushi effect going on. I do not like dill pickles. I hate <laughs> mustard. Pulled pork, I'm okay with. But like somehow it, there was also ham and something else going on there. Cheese, of course. I I didn't love it, but I am glad I tried it. It definitely works wasn't for me yeah no absolutely and I, and I can absolutely see where a lot of people would be avoiding that <laughs> that pizza but people should try it is uh, all i'm saying give yeah. it a shot you never know yeah no absolutely uh and again if you like cuban sandwiches absolutely oh, yeah. try it because i think this is a stunning pizza version of a cuban sandwich which is something i would never consider yeah yeah, we got we to gotta fix that. Maybe the next time Sean's in town, we'll meet up with Kevin and we'll do the same. There we go. So speaking of gaming, so someone in our chat wants to join us for some of this. So, <laughs> Oh, Wear Gator's here. Yeah, hey, Wear Gator's back Gator. again. And yes, it awesome. is amazing. Yeah, it's it's cool. I, I don't know if I shared a picture of that one yet. But anyway, we're here to talk games. So whenever we talk Sean Con, we got to squeeze some food in. Um, Next on the list was Brew Crafters Travel Card Game, right? Like we, we were playing this. This is a multi-use card game where the cards can be used as two different things. A tableau based engine builder. You're going to have a row of cards out, some cards in your hand. You're going to draft two cards, then either play a card from your hand 
into your tableau to improve your brewery or play a set of cards as ingredients. So every card's an improvement or an ingredient. Now, the brewery upgrades do all kinds of things like letting you draft cards for free, provide end game scoring, or make the, brews, the beers you do brew worth more points. Now, each different type of beer from ale to special reserve takes more ingredients, but the ones that take more ingredients are worth more than renown. So it's just a neat kind of interesting mix of the multi-use cards. Really simple to learn. What do you think of Brewcrafters travel card game? So, I mean, this was super simple, quick and easy to learn. Uh, and despite the three of us having varying strategies mm -hmm. and knowledge of the game, uh, we all ended within one point at the end of the game. Um, so there's definitely, you know, it, it's it's a forgiving game yep. uh, as well as just being, you know, quick and quick and simple. It, it would be hard to imagine not picking up that game really fast. Yeah. And, and to me, what was nice is I never played a three players. I'm still I'm still looking forward to playing four because floor has a thing where you play teams like you're each a each okay. the team in the brewery. Oh, yeah, you're only two breweries. Yeah, play. there's only two breweries competing. But so I, I still need to try, though. But I guess I did like it with three. And honestly, like, I honest, I have no clue. Maybe we're doing the bad thing where we're recommending games that are no longer available. That is possible. I, I apologize if we are. But this is a true hidden gem. Uh, quick and easy to teach. Cool theme. Mechanics that I actually think tied in pretty well. Like, what do you spend your money on? Do you spend it on improving your brewery or buying ingredients and brewing beer? Like, it, it all kind of fit. And this is one, the more you play, uh, the more strategy you see. Like, once you start realizing there's only um, four fruit and four coffee in the deck. and if you take that coffee and instead play it as your HR manager, that removes the coffee from the whole game. So it might screw over that other player who's going for a coffee strategy and stuff like that. I thought was really neat. And, and it would record reward some card counting. I guess I really do dig the game. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and I guess uh, if it didn't have the card blowing away issue on the patio, yeah. it would be nearly perfect for pub crawls. Um, mm -hmm. I do think the holders give Racco the edge at, at the pub crawl. Uh, even if Brewcrafters itself as a game is more portable. True. I think we just need a set of those tight hands to hold the cards. We'll just get those. Yeah, I no, we don't. Uh, um, at <laughs> least not if you like the edges of your cards lasting. For the majority of people not in the know, Mo is referring to a product which we were asked to promote, which would unquestionably damage your cards while holding them upright or allowing you to build card towers by cheating with, you know, reinforced mechanical advantage I, uh, they seem like they might be useful but i would only want to use like nice plasticized bicycle cards when using them yeah. i don't think my brew crafters travel card game cards would hold up no nope. no that was more of an inside joke <laughs> all right moving on my biggest surprise of the weekend cowboy bebop space serenade uh this one was sent to us from japan Game, games so thank you for that uh this is a deck building game pretty traditional deck builder based on the famous anime where you take on the one of the crew of the bellhop or of the bebop, not the bellhop. I see that. And it looks like bellhop. You play one of the crew of the bebop and travel between three different planets. Planets. Wow. You play one of the crew of the bebop and travel between planets, hunting bounties, all of which come from the show. There we go. Better. Uh, eventually the game does shift to hunting down and capturing or defeating vicious. I uh, feature some really well done team up mechanics. And despite being a competitive game, you're still able to use each other's abilities in a very interesting way, um, which really does a lot to tie in the theme into the mechanics, because like your unique player abilities and having to collect fuel to travel, as well as awesome components, like one of the best box inserts we've ever seen. Fantastic looking minis double layer player boards and this is not a kickstarter game what were your impressions of cowboy bebop space serenade yeah i the, the i i'd forgotten to comment on the uh on the box insert because yeah it was free. really i mean every little there was no need for plastic baggies everything mm -hmm. fit and was held in place in its own place perfectly like it just e even the components that you built after punching there yeah, was spaces for some, it everything there was you know, a bit of assembly yeah, everything everything just fit back in the box perfectly. Uh, the only the other strange thing was why they gave you standees and some yeah. reasonably nice miniatures. <laughs> yeah, I honestly, this really feels like they were going to kickstart it, and the miniatures were going to be a stretch goal that they were going to give you whether they hit it or not. 
Yeah. And I, and I think COVID might have interfered with that. I don't know. That That's that's speculation. though. Possibly. Now, while there was one somewhat odd rule regarding movement that, that still yeah. seems a little strange to me, uh, aside from that, uh, and it wasn't a deal breaker at all. It was just sort of like, a, oh, I wonder why you have to do that. Uh, yeah. It was a solid game uh, with some interesting mechanics in the combos that weren't as simple as, oh, just make sure you get all the cards for this character and mm -hmm. you'll be able to do all the fancy combos. Well, no, because the combos varied as to who who could combo off of what and the way the colors work. Yeah. Uh, and that and that made for some really interesting and, and thoughtful play. You weren't just grabbing the most expensive card from the market. Yeah, the thing it did here was kind of like the Star Realms thing, right? Where it's like, oh, if you have a green card and you play another green card, they combo off. But it tends to be in Star Realms that your green cards combo with your green. Whereas this one, there were four different colors for the four characters, but there were combos for each of the other characters. So it wasn't like your red cards combo off your red. It's your your red card you just played combos off a yellow you played earlier. And it was right. really neat. Yeah, the dual color cards made for an interesting... Uh... Yeah, very I, overall, I was really impressed by this. Like, Like, it just was way better than I was expecting. And, and it's not like I was expecting it to be bad. I just wasn't expecting it to be as good as it was. I love the fact that all four characters are in play no matter what. So you have the four bounty hunters in play and how moving other characters around to best make use of their special abilities was a big part of the game. And I dig that, like, even playing together, you could move someone that doesn't necessarily want to help you and then they have to come help you, which I got to say is a good thematic tie in to Bebop for anyone who's seen the show. It's not like the four of the characters always just like happy go lucky, one at things on their own. How many times did Faye steal them out? Bounty, right? Now, at this point, we've only played once, but so far, uh, this seems like a hit. Like, if you're a Bebop fan, this is probably worth picking up. Yeah, I'm interested to see how this plays out at different player counts. Mm -hmm. But at three, it was definitely a solid game. Um, uh, and while uh, certainly helpful for the fun, I don't think knowledge of the series is a complete requirement. No, definitely not a requirement, but I do think it helps, especially knowing the characters and even the 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 bounties, right? Knowing you're going after Teddy Bomber or whatever, like you're going to recognize it and you're going to have fun there. Um, actually, I'll find out this probably this weekend. We'll play with a couple who have never seen Cowboy Bebop, see how that goes, works. Now, I will note at this point that this game does predate the Netflix series. So I will say even knowledge of the Netflix series is going to help, though you're probably not going to realize who one of the characters are because they only show up in kind of like an end credit scene. But you'll at least recognize the other three characters and most of the bounties and the whole vicious thing. Indeed, this is unquestionably the anime. But since they've already canceled the live action, I doubt it's going to be remembered all that long anyway. Ah, very true. Very true. Maybe it'll be the next Firefly and people will be talking about it for years. Now, our only five-player game of the weekend was a game of the Quacks of Quillenberg with the Herb Witches expansion using all my shiny new geek up bits. Thanks again, kids. Um, I think most people know Quacks, but I'm going to go over it just in case you don't. Uh, this is a push-your-luck game about drawing ingredients from a bag and adding them to your pot while trying not to explode and getting points and the ability to buy more ingredients each round. Herb Witches adds new ingredients and recipes as well as witches that give you a way to mitigate the randomness and uh, add other scoring opportunities. And that's about as short as I can explain Quacks. Now, we've all played Quacks before and the expansion, but this is the first time you actually got to play with the Geek Up bits. That's the part I was thinking about how it was new to you. Are they not awesome? Yeah, what a huge difference they make. Uh, you can still get bad pulls, but yeah. it feels like luck is the problem. And not that you're worried about things being wedged in the corner mm -hmm. of the bag. Yeah, I know a lot of people are still like, hey, you're going to get the round of bags. You're going to get the round of corner bags. Don't you need the bags? But I'm not even sure if they're needed now. Sure, it would be cool. But at the cost, I, I don't think I can justify. Uh, I did notice there was one pull where I noticed something. I had, I had the bag held at an angle. And so there was a, a corner here and a corner here. And as I was shifting it, uh, and I think I was I was giving up, I'd noticed that there was someone caught in the top corner. So oh, they yeah. aren't. So all... it's still possible. Yeah, it's but... not. It's not perfect. But I mean, I, if I'd given it a bigger shake, it probably would have yeah. just fallen down. Like I'll admit, stuff. There's still corners. Stuff gets in there, but like you don't not notice it as. Yeah, much. it's like not. You... It's not anywhere near the problem yeah. it was uh, before. So what do you think of this play? Because I know you haven't played it nearly as much as us. No, no, no. So having seen more of the ingredients now, 
what I find is that there are it feels really clear that there are some that are, I are at least in pre you know, opinion better than others. Okay. So, so do you mean individual ingredients are better or types of the ingredients are better? Like, like I know there are some I prefer, but I don't know if I call them better because they affect everyone, right? Like none of it feels game breaking. Like, Oh, there's a broken ingredient. Well, everyone can buy it. So how is it broken? Like the six pumpkins, everyone takes the time to save up. You can all buy them. Or you mean the 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 fact that like no one's gonna buy the yellows this game because they're garbage? Yeah, I guess more enjoyable instead of better. I guess is probably right. a better word. Uh, some flavors of the different ingredients just aren't as much fun. Okay. Uh, you know, with preferences for which version of an ingredient you're gonna want to see on come up mm. uh, developing the more you play it. Yeah, I'll admit I've had that since the first time we played the the, the blue crow's head where you get the pull a number of tokens out of your bag based on the, the number on the ingredient. Then you get to pick that like out of those you play one and the rest go back. And that's still my favorite ingredient. I, I'm sure every group probably has their own list of their preferred <laughs> ingredients. And I, at some point I'm probably get to a point where I'm like, we're going to play with this set or I'm going to make a notepad file and list what my favorite set is. I still like randomizing them though. Yep. Next up we have uh, what I'll call the biggest disappointment of the weekend. And that is, all the bass doors of Cartagena, uh, which Grand Gamers Guild shipped up to us from Gen Con, thanks to fan of the show Kevin. I'm sorry to say, Mark, this one is a little bit too overwhelming for the first couple of plays. Now, all the boss is a tableau building area majority game where players are playing doors with very fancy knockers on them. That's the whole Cartagena thing. Um, onto the table, forming a three by four grid. Now, each card played triggers a special effect and then activates the doors beside it and blow it. Don't forget that on your first play. <laughs> Point scoring is pretty opaque, um, especially the first time through, with only the players having the most and second most influence in each door suit actually scoring everything. And it's one of those where, like, not everyone scores everything and all that matters that you score is if you're the winner in those two suits. And honestly, even trying to describe it quickly here it sounds like a lot, and that's because it is. Now, I got to say, you didn't seem to dig this one much yourself. Uh, I wouldn't say I didn't like it. Um, the first play was certainly tricky to catch all the details. Mm -hmm. And then, unfortunately, on that second play, we saw a potential strategy that may or may not be badly skewed. Yeah. Um, honestly, until that emerged during scoring, I was actually enjoying it once I... You know, because I, I that second play, I'd sort mm -hmm. of figured out the rules and was feeling more confident about my play. Yeah, the second game definitely went way better than the first game. I almost feel like there should be a teaching game with only three suits or something. I don't know. It just that, that the real problem to me seems like the game's overwhelming. Um, in the same way, Race for the Galaxy is the first time you play. It's a front. It's, just, it's a front loading issue. Yeah, uh, there are a ton of icons. And multiple suits to keep track of. Was it six suits in the base game without the expansion? It's either six or five. I can't remember. Oh, off the top yeah, of my head. Um, and then each suit scores completely different from the other. And then the influence range on each suit's different. And I guess I, after two plays, things started to make much more sense. But I think it's that learning curve that kind of impacted our impressions. Now, I think there's a good game here. We just got to get through the door, right? Mm -hmm. I just think we haven't gotten to the level of mastery to really see uh, to have this game shine um something i'm really tempted to start calling the side effect based on our review from a couple weeks ago i just feel like i need to play with this game and explore it more at this point i haven't given up um i look forward to trying it again now that everyone knows what's going on a bit better i have a feeling our next couple plays will be better yeah right now my only real concern about the game is this one strategy and whether or yeah. not it's overpowered uh or if it was just a fluke um uh, sure. And then I would do worry that even if it's kind of a fluke, if you've got an experienced player who can counter it, if you've got experienced players playing with new players, it's pretty easy to take advantage of that. Uh, that when a new player, if if the new if you do need to count actively counteract this, right? Yeah, I can totally see that. Though at this point, what I'd probably think, like if I do discover, yes, that one strategy seems pretty powerful. As a game teacher, I would just point out that particular strategy. Hey, watch for players doing this. Um, I remember I was playing a game of Fleet with the designers, and I got to get two of, oh, what is it? It's like the fishing contract. And and here, Matt Riddle's like, don't let him get a second. Oh, you let him get a second fishing contract. You never let anyone get a second <laughs> fishing contract. So maybe that's all it is. But at this point, we played twice, right? Like, this is not a formal final review. 
Um, I have we looked on Board Game Geek and like Twitter feeds and stuff. I didn't see anyone else complaining about this dominant strategy, which I'm not mentioning because I don't want anyone else to like yeah, go exactly. there and start trying to use it. I don't want to I don't want to give it away, but I, I haven't seen anyone else complain about a dominant strategy. So it could have been a fluke. And honestly, this is why we try to play most of our games at least five times before sharing our final thoughts. Yeah, indeed. It could just be that we had a new player at the table uh, and I hadn't considered that particular idea. So with a few of the right draws unopposed, you were able to run with it. Yeah. Uh, it, it is definitely worthy of exploration, though, to find out whether or not. Yeah, it was one of the, I played the first game and I was like, okay, I, there's one thing I get about this game. This seems like a good way to get points. So I decided to like fully lean into that the second game and like more than doubled everyone else's. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next, Garinto. Sean's obviously played this before, but I had actually forgotten that the only time he played was the prototype copy that we played in January of 2019 at easy mode, which was for my birthday before all the lockdown started. So he's never actually gotten to play with the final components. Uh, plus he hadn't tried the seasons of change variant, which I prefer. So added to that, we are also trying out something on announce that we can't really talk about other than say it seemed like a really solid addition to the game. Now, we talk about Grinto a lot, but just for anyone who's new to the show, this is a tile drafting and placing game where you take element tiles from the path and put them onto the mountain. Note, this is a physical thing with nice, thick, like upwards like tiles. Um, the when you place tiles onto the mountain, you are then going to take off tiles based on the element you use. Then the number you take off is based on your knowledge in that element. And that's just how many you've already collected in the game earlier. Scoring is randomized at the start of the game and is based on your knowledge of the elements of the end game. So how many of each tile you've collected. It's a brilliant game and honestly one of the best games I've ever played and one of the best games in my collection. So we already know Sean likes the game. He enjoyed it back when we played it. But what was it like playing the production copy? Well, I don't think there's much I can say that we haven't already said about this game in various episodes. Honestly, the only negative is that the tiles are hard to separate by hand. Yeah. Uh, um, otherwise with one hand yeah, yeah well otherwise it's a more polished version of a game i knew was great and what do you think of seasons of change so what that one is is normally when you play garanto the base rules are you put two scoring cards up and they stay up there for all four rounds of the game seasons of change you put four up and they rotate so only two score each season i prefer that way to play what do you think yeah indeed i think it makes more sense to have that as the default scoring yeah. From what I hear from Mark, that may be the default for the uh, the the next update. If a, if a second edition of Grinto, if a reprint comes, that may be an official rule. And it will probably have a, for your first game, don't do this, but otherwise this will be a way to play. Right. And as for the shiny new thing, uh, we're just going to keep teasing you with this one until Mark tells me I'm allowed to announce it. So Stay tuned for more when we're allowed to talk about it. And still, publishers, why? Why not let me hype it now? Drives me nuts. NVTS. Bonker, sorry. Next up, two plays. Castles of Mad King Ludwig, three players. Uh, first was an extreme play. Second was the proper game with the proper rules using the Secrets expansion. Uh, this is a wonky economic tile placing game um, all about building a castle out of odd-shaped rooms of different sizes and corridors and stairs and gardens and all kinds of stuff. Brilliant bits in this game include the room designs themselves and how they actually fit together and a neat system where the active player sets the prices for everything and players, when they're buying tiles, pay that player in money. And that's part of the economy. Um, this particular play was inspired by one of our awesome Patreon patrons who just got the deluxe Kickstarter edition. And man, am I jealous. But as soon as that came up in our Discord, I'm like, Sean, you haven't played Mad King Live Week, have you? He's like, nope. So out it came. Now, this was your first ever Mad King Lurie game. What'd you think, ignoring the fact we missed a pretty pivotal rule the first run? Uh, I really need to give this one another chance, being unfamiliar with it. And I made some mistakes and poor choices I later regretted. <laughs> Still, it is a solid, fun game. And I think yep. the economic system in it, when you get it right, <laughs> is really brilliant yes. and, a, and a, a shining feature of the game. Oh, I agree. And and honestly, making mistakes that you later regretted is pretty much the castles of Berg or castles of Mad King Ludwig. Sorry, too many castles of games. <laughs> Learning curve for that game. Like even Deanna and I made some mistakes. 
Um, now, second game. Second game, we threw in the Secrets expansion. This added moats, uh, secret doors, new rooms, and collecting swans, which adds like a set collection element. Personally, I find the secret doors a bit fiddly, but I like the rest of the new additions. And I'm still impressed Deanna actually managed to close in her entire moat. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'd ever seen that before. What'd you think of the Secrets expansion? Yeah, the Secret Doors, I never got to use. I made some poor choices in uh, early design uh, and blocked myself off. Uh, then combined with poor rooms coming up for my needs uh, and bad directions to uh, head strategy-wise, there was just nothing I could connect that, you know, yeah, two X's times zero is still zero. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the secret room's getting two times when you're not scoring your points didn't help. Now, you did rock the swan collecting, though. You did better than both of us. True. Swans loved my utterly mediocre moat. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you avoided the moat system, which may have been a valid strategy. That is the one thing with secrets is, is there's hotly debated. Do you need to build moats to win? And in our game, it worked for Deanna. She did win the game. So I don't know if they're totally necessary yet. Now, the one thing I do want to mention in regards to castles is my folly here. Don't do what I did. If it's been more than three years, see, I was, at first I was saying a year since I played this. No, I haven't played since COVID. So it's been more than three years since I played this game. Don't think a quick flip through the rules, even if they're only about five pages, is going to be enough of a refresher. Uh, take the time to actually sit down, reread the rules where everyone else sets the game up, shuffles the tiles or something. I don't know goes and makes coffee, whatever it happens to be. I totally forgot the rule that you put money on the tiles that aren't taken. And while it didn't ruin the game, it meant that we were all strapped for cash and spent far too many actions just taking five mil from the bank and not actually building things. So our castles were very small. Indeed. And while we do adore rigid setup guides uh, from various sources, yes. they aren't as useful if you don't already remember the rules in general. Yes. <laughs> And we made another mistake that, that probably wasn't impactful that I didn't realize the secrets added more tiles. So our stacks of tiles were too tall, which didn't matter because we didn't have the money to buy them anyway. So that didn't actually <laughs> impact anything. But like we had some of the swan cards in and I got to say, that's one part of the game I don't like is the setup with secrets where you're like, I need five of the original tiles and three of the swan tiles and mix them. That's fiddly and annoying. But other than that, I still really dig castles. Next up comes Shikoku. This is another Grand Gamers game guild sent up from Gen Con. Uh, this is a very unique racing game where you don't want to be in first or last, and it's the players in second and second last who win. Use a very interesting card drafting and player order system that, while simple to learn, rewards players who are paying attention. That's all I want to say about this one right now, because we are going to be reviewing Shikoku later in the show, and we'll have a lot more to say then. Any quick thoughts on Shikoku for now? If you don't mind the end game, it's a quick fun filler for a wide range of ages and skills. Now, what I love the most about this one is its uniqueness. I don't own any other game where it's the players in second and second last that win. That alone makes it worth being in my collection. Collector's gonna collect, y'all. <laughs> Next, we have the second most played game of the weekend. That is Chiseled, the deck sculpting game. Now, again, sent to us from Grand Gamers Guild. Thanks for all these games, Mark. Uh, this is a deck deconstruction game where everyone part starts with an identical 45-card deck filled with heads, arms, and bodies in three different materials as well as a bunch of scrap cards. Each turn, players are going to select a tool card, use it to remove cards from their deck in one way or another. Now, each tool works completely differently, letting you trash different amounts of cards from different places and different orders and so on. Not worth getting into here. Now, the goal is to cut down your deck just enough to be left with the perfect statue before the critics arrive and judge your work. What did you think of Chiseled? You know, I wasn't sure what to think of this one, as it almost seemed too easy and simple based on, you know, a quick glance at the BGG page and watching you unbox it. Mm -hmm. Yet with the range of tools you get to work with, yeah. you get some really great interactions and some fun planning to not get stuck with the wrong tool for your yes. needs. Uh, so it's not, and it's, so it's not just a, sol a, a solitaire game as well. There is that interaction with the other players through uh, both, you know, sort of hate drafting tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a few tools which do interact with other people's decks. Yes. The, 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 
my favorite part of this game is when someone does something and it doesn't work. Whether that's you make someone flip over a card or most likely in our first play, and I think this is where we were totally sold on the game, is when Sean grabbed the saw early in the game and basically cut his whole statue in half because he just kept going with this saw and Sean flipping the cards going, no, no, there goes an arm. I can't stop. I can't stop. I need to fix it. Maybe if I cut this chunk off, no, it's worse. That that was an awesome moment. And I will say that is the the worst. Well, actually, it probably paid off in the end. I think you won that. Yeah, game. it didn't actually. Uh, it, 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 it didn't was hurt horrifying. as much as it felt. It was horrifying as it happened. Uh, but it actually didn't turn out as, as badly as it could. Uh, you know, yeah. losing a losing a couple of bits off the head was the the worst of it. Yeah, and thankfully wax was in place. You were able to replace most of what you lost. Exactly, so it, it turned out pretty good. Games without wax are definitely harder. Um, I really like this one. It's better. I re- I was curious. I had no clue if I was going to enjoy the game at all. I just wanted to see how it worked, and it ends up it's really good. Everyone I've taught this game has really enjoyed it. Uh, the theme integration here is top notch. Like you almost get that bit of immersion where you literally are shaving parts off of your deck, ending up with a finer deck at the end. Now, the scoring system is a bit wonky, though it tends to work as long as you think of the number of cards in your deck, meaning the number of hours you spend on each part that tends to work. And just don't think of the fact that you want nine heads. No, you're spending nine hours working on the face because that's the focal point. Um, we've actually played Chiseled more since you left. We've been enjoying this one so much. I- I'm not really surprised. I can't see anyone in your family or extended family that wouldn't grok this game and get mm. into it. Now, oddly, the box has this listed as 14 plus, and I don't understand why. Um, thankfully, Board Game Geek Community agrees with me as an 8 plus game. Because if you are over 13 years of age, there is less safety testing you need to do on your game. That is the only reason. It's a card game. There's no I, safety testing required. There are I no small know. pieces in the game. So I, that doesn't... That's all, it's someone who <laughs> thinks that they need safety testing Yeah, I, if they're I, under 13. I don't know. That's the reason many, many games... Well, I, I'm aware of that, the but it, there are no components in this game. It's a deck of cards. Yeah. So I, That's all I can think of is, is the publisher was like, oh, no, we don't want to have to do safety yeah. testing. 14 know. plus. All right. Unfortunately, our chat room isn't willing to take a guess. So our most played game of the last ever Sean Con was Point Salad. Uh, this game is so simple. I'll basically teach you to play right here. You take a deck that has an even number of six different ingredients, cards, each which has a scoring mechanic on the back. Shuffle them up, put them into three equal piles with the scoring side flip up, flipped up, or sorry, score, uh, scoring side up and flip two cards from each stack up to become the market. On your turn, take a point card or take any two ingredient cards and replace any ingredients from the decks above. Keep going until the deck runs out, then everyone totals their points on their scorecards based on what ingredients they've drafted. Now, there is one little rule to throw a little bit of a wrench into that, and that is you can flip over one scoring card you already own to its ingredient side. Just tie you how to play point salad. What'd you think of this? Pretty simple to learn, but difficult to master card game. Really, the only problem is that the card quality is not going to hold up to the amount of times it's going to get played. Uh, It's such a simple game. It's hard to understand how no one has really done it before. (laughs) Yeah, honestly, this is one of those games like, man, why didn't I think of that? Though I got to say the the skill required in coming up with the combination of point cards is definitely above any design chops I've got. Yeah, this one is so good. Like, I, I admit, everyone raved about this. This is another one of those super hyped games that I just never got to play until recently, and the hypes deserve. Uh, this is one of the easiest to teach games in my collection, but not so easy to win. Um, There's lots to pay attention to. Now, as for the card quality, they are definitely thin, which I got to say is an advantage when shuffling. And so far, they're holding up pretty good, but only time will tell how well they hold up overall. Yeah, the key I found to Point Salad is really anticipation. You know what, there are six vegetables there. (laughs) That's never going to change. So decide what you want to score and go for it. Make it happen. Because when you're trying to play catch up, you're leaving just too much to luck as to what point cards are going to come up and be available on your turn. Holy 
through, though I have seen someone play it the other way where they just kept collecting veggies and were like, oh, 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 look at that. Oh, that scores. So I don't know. I, I don't know if that's valid, but I will admit that's usually how I play. Um, you know what? I don't think we need to say more now because we're at the point now. I played this enough. We, we're already up to a lot of plays for in a short period of time, and I expect more plays this weekend. So you know what? I, I'll officially announce it. We are going to review Point Salad next week. So we'll do a full detailed review next week. That'll be our featured review after our AMA. So more info next week on Point Salad, though, spoiler, we like it a lot. <laughs> well, that's it for our list of games that uh, we played during this last of the Sean Con. Uh, have you played any of these games? What's your favorite? Uh, let us know down in the comments below. Remember, we're usually here to answer your gaming and game night questions. And yes, we did have people on our Discord asking us what we played. So it's not like we went off on our own here. We just didn't have a nice formalized question for this week. If you got a question for us, though, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hit me up on social media. 